Thank you very much and good morning everybody. Uh, my name is Susan Douglas. I'm delighted to be here this morning. Um, uh, I have to say I was, I'm quite nervous. It's quite an odd setup with you all of the way over there. Um, but I did dream last night that I had to do a cookery demonstration for you all. So I'm actually in that kind of blessed state of relief that actually I'm not trying to cook lamb cofters or anything live on stage. So I'm actually quite pleased about that. Um, just by way of background to, to explain to you um, the... Uh, to, 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 to enjoy. Um, but the two roles that I currently do, the first is that I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the Eden Academy Trust, uh, which is a group of nine schools in England. They're all state schools, they're free to go to, um, but they all cater for children uh, with significant learning difficulties. And the second job that I do is at the British Council, which is the UK's cultural relations organisation. I'm one of the senior schools advisors there, working on school policy and practice. And the main areas I work on there are school leadership, inclusion, and also the progression and integration uh, of core skills into the national curriculum. And it's because of those two roles that I do and the observations and experiences I've had in those roles that I've chosen to therefore talk about today, as you will see in front of you, capturing progress when things are difficult to measure. And I should say right at the beginning, I am a practitioner. I am not an academic. So even though the things that I'm going to be talking to you about today are evidence-based, I'm going to talk about them in a very practical way today. And I've divided the presentation up into uh, four sections. So uh, firstly, the role of good assessment, and secondly, the principles of good assessment. And I'm going to spend a very short amount of time on that because I'm very well aware that I'm talking to a room full of experts about that and that you already know all of those things. But I want to just remind us of them right at the beginning so that when I talk about the things that I think are difficult to measure, I can refer back to the role and principles of good assessment. Because the two areas that I've chosen to talk about that I think are difficult to measure are first of all assessing core skills or 21st century skills or soft skills or uh, competencies or whatever it is in your particular country that you call them. But that's the first one, so assessing core skills which fits with your first conference theme about alternative types of assessment. And the second thing that I think is really difficult to measure is around capturing the pro progression of pupils with complex needs, which fits with theme two of your, of your conference here uh, in Nairobi. So those are the things that I'm going to be talking about. So just briefly then, um, on the role of good assessment. So firstly, of course, uh, good assessment allows us to improve or target teaching. Good teachers use formative assessment all the time, as we know, to understand what children have learnt, to identify gaps in their knowledge, and inform the next steps in their teaching. Secondly, summative assessment, of course, allows us to monitor system performance, informing schools, governments, and local partners how much children have learnt over a period of time, enabling them to monitor standards, identify schools that are particularly good in doing things so that we can learn from them, and to target support where needed. It gives students and maybe future employees, employers um, a record of their achievement. It supports us with selection processes or transitions into, for example, universities or into employment. And importantly, it allows us to determine efficacy of certain interventions that we're introducing into the classroom. So, for example, if you were going to in, uh, introduce synthetic phonics into your classroom, assessment allows us to monitor how efficacious those are, how successful those are in improving learner outcomes. And finally, it allows us to learn from excellence. So it allows us to look across countries to identify strong performers from which we can learn, uh, examples, of course, including things like PISA or uh, measuring progress uh, on the SDGs. And, or, and in order to create those good assessments, these must be premised on certain key principles. So firstly, purpose. That the assessments have a really clear purpose with a design, content, and administration of an assessment varying depending on what it is being used for and why. 
Secondly, that it's aligned to the curriculum, so what children are actually being taught and what we, as the educators, want to know about, which sounds obvious, but assessing a child's ability to understand fractions is not going to tell us about how much they understand about shape, for example. And that principle is really important for later, which is why I'm, uh, I'm, I'm emphasizing it. That there's sufficient coverage of the curriculum. Here's a picture of British summertime, by the way this year particularly. So the, the third principle is that there is sufficient uh, coverage of the curriculum. So obviously assessments are a snapshot, aren't they, in time of what children can know and what children do, sampling from the full curriculum. But there need to be enough questions on a particular skill area in order to ensure assessments are valid. Good assessments avoid floor and ceiling effects, so they don't uh, um, mean that all children get 100% or that nobody scores anything on, on a test. So they're not too easy and they're not too hard. They're unbiased. I do think that's always very complex. The aim is to assess particular skills and obviously avoid uh, questions which might benefit some, others, uh, some more than others because of unrelated factors. So for example, uh, let me think, uh, questions uh, that might assume a knowledge of air travel, for example, which some children will have experienced, some children won't have experienced. So trying to avoid bias in question. And then finally, avoiding assessing irrelevant things. And I'm very familiar with this. Um, once in a previous role, I had to write uh, maths test questions. Terribly difficult. I never realized, for those of you that are test, test writers, writers in the room, in the room never, realized never realized how difficult, how difficult, it, was difficult it was to write a really good examination question. And obviously when you're writing mathematical questions, it's all too easy to put language in there that actually means that you're testing a child's ability to decode and read rather than actually te uh, testing uh, whether they have understood the mathematical concept. So really good assessments avoid assessing irrelevant things. And finally, of course, they need to be manageable both for teachers and children and therefore delivered consistently to different children at different times. So very briefly those are my ideas about uh, the principle and purpose of good assessments. So the important bit then what happens when things are difficult to measure? So the first area I want to talk about is uh, capturing progress related to skills or competencies as lots of people mentioned yesterday, people call them different things. 21st century skills, core skills, core competency, essential skills, etc. At the British Council, we tend to call them core skills. So uh, if you'll allow me to do that today, that would be great. And at the British Council, we've been working on this area for about 10 years now, uh, based on our belief that if every country in the world is going to develop a high quality, inclusive education system that supports all young people to develop the knowledge, skills and values they need to live and work in a globalized society and contribute responsibly both locally and globally. We need to develop curriculum and pedagogy at system level premised on the acquisition of both knowledge and skills. And that may seem very obvious, but it's an interesting uh, discussion in England at the moment where our Minister of Education is very much focused on a knowledge-rich curriculum and doesn't want us to put any emphasis at all on skills development, for example. So uh, whilst it may be, particularly in Africa, I think, something that people really believe in, that balance between knowledge and skills, that isn't the case everywhere. But that's what we believe at the British Council. They need both and we fundamentally believe that the timing of the introduction of any work on skills development is crucial because we believe that students need knowledge first, but that once they've mastered that, teachers can then phase in skill development work that tests the application and manipulation of that knowledge. And we've concentrated our work particularly on things like problem solving, team working, communication, leadership skills, etc., and work with governments all over the world, we've had the absolute pleasure of working uh, here in Kenya with uh, NEC, but also we've worked with UNEB in Uganda, we've worked in Ghana, Algeria, Pakistan, and India. And the interesting thing about that range of diverse places that I've just listed is that each has faced a common challenge, not necessarily the one that you might expect, the people didn't believe that teaching skills was important, it wasn't that. It was more about how do we define progress in relation to those skills and how do we then measure that progression. So teachers told us 
We agree our pupils need to be good problem solvers. We might even know what good problem solving looks like at age four and what good problem solving looks like at age 18. But do we know the nuance of what great problem solving looks like at age eight and at age nine? Do our, are our teachers really confident that they know what skills they are deliberately going to teach explicitly in the classroom that continues to build on that progression? And actually, that's really important. So if we just go back to what I said about the purpose of uh, assessment, one of the really important things about uh, a, a assessment is that it captures achievement. And just to pick out a couple of examples, we said good assessment systems give students or potential employers a record of achievement, and it helps with selection and transition. Our more traditional exam systems, of course, show us what pupils know about certain subject areas. But how can we capture whether a f if you're a future, you know, if, you, if you're an employer, how can we capture whether a future employee is a good team player, can communicate well in public on behalf of my organisation, for example? So I'm not a believer in one size fits all, and I'm not suggesting that what I'm going to talk about now is the answer because I don't think there's ever an answer in education, but I think this is one helpful way of thinking about this complex area. And that's via a framework called the Universal Framework, which uh, has been built by an uh, organization that we partner with um, called Skills Builder. So Skills Builder focuses on the skills that you see here in front of you. So listening, speaking, problem solving, creativity, staying positive, haven't we needed that one over the last three years? <laughs> Aiming high, leadership, and teamwork. And as you can just see, just in the slightly lighter colors below each one of those, it breaks the, those eight skills down into a sequence of 16 steps across four main phases, starting with the absolute beginner and developing all the way to mastery. It's completely open source, so I'm not selling anything here. If you like the look of it, take a look of it. If you don't, you don't. It's just a way of thinking about it, I think. But it's backed by years of research. It's developed with leading businesses and employers and academics. And so therefore tries to consolidate all the array of frameworks that are out there and put it into something really comprehensive. And most importantly for me, something that's really practical and enables us, based on an assessment of an individual's current skill level, to start on one of those stages or to choose a particular area that they want to work on. So I thought I'd, I'd, the best way of doing this really is to look at an example. I'm a primary teacher at heart, so I work on examples. The best way to look at this is, is via an example. I hope you can read that. I know it's a bit small, but I'll, I'll make sure people get access to the slides afterwards. So, um, so the example that I've got in front of, of you now is about teamwork. Um, and as you can see, it works from step zero, which is the very first one, so I work with others in a positive way, all the way to step 15, I support the team by bringing in external expertise and relationships. And you'll see that, what it, what, that it's uh, broken into four different stages. So from step zero to step five is the first one, which is all about working well with others. So step zero, I work well in a positive way. Step one, I work with others by behaving appropriately. Step two, I work well with others by being on time and reliable. Up to step five, so I work well with others by understanding and respecting diversity of others' cultures, beliefs, and backgrounds. Now that's the first step. The, 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 next, the next section is the intermediate step, which is about contributing to a group. So you'll see it's about decision making, respecting other people's views, and then encouraging other people to voice those views. You can see how it's getting more nuanced as it goes on. Steps nine to 11 is about improving a team. So I improve the team by, by not creating unhelpful conflicts. Uh, step 10, I improve the team by resolving unhelpful conflicts, etc. And then finally, on to influencing a team. So that's your kind of mastery level. And I'll just give you one more example before I, I go on. This one, this next one, oh, problem solving. You'll see again that's broken into four different stages from getting started on problem solving through to exploring problems and then analyzing complex problems and solutions. And then when you get to the mastery stage, you're talking about implementing strategic plans. So 
What you see here then, and I think this is important in both the areas that I'm going to talk about, is this helps us, first of all, define progression. What does good progression look like in relation to a particular skill? And in the countries in which we've worked, we've been looking at integrating one of these steps into one year group and working on that particular step in lots of different subject areas across the year. So if we take step four here of the problem-solving um, uh, strand, you'll see it says, I explore problems by creating different possible solutions. And what we might do with step four is we might integrate it in year four, for example. I'm, I, I'm using England as an example. So that's children who are about eight or nine years old. And in a geography lesson, for example, we might be therefore saying, okay, so can you explore how you might travel from London to Manchester? So can you give me the options, please, for, for how you might travel from London to Manchester? It's an example of a complicated problem rather than a simple one. Complex problems come kind of later down in the framework. And pupils are explicitly taught that sort of language as part of the learning for this step. But I think the beauty of this ready-made progression is how I teach it, how I integrate it into which subject area can be contextualized within each country. So how I teach it will be different to how David teaches it, which will be different to how Anne teaches it, et cetera, et cetera. And certainly what we've done in the countries where we've worked with And we know children can uh, apply their, 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 that skill in, in different circumstances. And by doing it in lots of different subject areas, we hopefully eliminate a little bit of that subjectivity um, and bias. Okay, I'm going to hope that somebody's given me a microphone down here because I just want to show you then and go into it just very, very quickly. I'm just going to show you what it looks like behind, behind the eye. Just a little bit more about me.
Best laid plans, internet isn't connecting. Give me one second while it connects. Yes, marvelous. Best laid plans that work beautifully this morning. It's not going to work today. We'll abandon that. If anybody would like me to show you that later, I'll show it you. So basically what, what I was going to show you was actually um, the detail behind one of the steps, essentially. So behind each one of those steps, uh, Skills Builder is going to give you the building blocks behind each of the steps. It's going to give you some examples of how you might teach it. It's going to give you some examples about how you might assess it. And it's going to give information not only for teachers, but also for parents about how they can back that up, for employees about how they might test that, and also for individuals about how they might develop that uh, in relation to that particular skill. So I'm sorry that I couldn't show you that in more detail, but we can, we can look at that at another time, or I'll make sure you get the link so that you can look in, in greater detail on it. Okay. So I should say, just to finish that particular section, as I say, I'm, not, I'm certainly not suggesting that this is the answer to uh, skills assessment, but I do think it's particularly helpful in terms of what good looks like in relation to progression in skills. Because I think one of the reasons why we find things difficult to measure is when we're not clear about what good progression looks like. And I think this gives us a really clear and tangible framework for what good looks like in relation to progression in terms of each of those core skills. Okay, so I'm gonna move on. How am I doing for time? I'm gonna move on to talk about my second strand, which I think is particularly difficult to measure, which is around capturing the progress of pupils with complex needs. I'm slightly anxious now, because I'm gonna show a video in a minute, and I'm hoping that's gonna work as well. So just before I do show the video, a little bit about the Eden Academy Trust, which is the group of schools that I have responsibility for in England. We have about 800 pupils based across nine schools. So they're all very small schools. Uh, with the smallest catering for just 50 pupils. And although we have some children who have moderate learning difficulties, so who might go on to take entry-level examinations, who might live semi-independently, who might take up employment, the vast majority have severe or profound learning difficulties. This means that we have both a primary and secondary children who are functioning anywhere between zero to five months and what might be expected of a typical six-year-old. I, I hate the word typical, average, age expected. I hate all of those words. I always think, I'm not a parent myself, but I always think that if I went to a parent's evening and a teacher said to me, you know, your child is, is doing fine, they're, they're average, I think it must be the most awful thing to hear, really, because, you know, you'd be wanting to say, actually, I think you'll find my child is extraordinary. But, <laughs> so, um, but, they, but that's the kind of range of ability that we have at, at Eden. So from about zero to five months up to um, uh, what we might expect from uh, a child of around six years old. And that's primary and secondary. That goes all the way up uh, to 19 years old. So just to be really clear, these are not children who would be able to take national exams through adaptations. National exams would not necessarily be right for any of these children. These children may always be non-verbal. Uh, these children may never learn to read or write. 
uh, because actually that, that's beyond their intellectual capacity. So what we're trying to look at here then is how do we measure the progress for that particular group of children? Because measuring progress for those children is just as important as it is for any other child. And that's why I wanted to talk about that today. But I'm hoping that the clever man at the back is just going to show you a very short video of Eden so you can just get a sense really of the types of children that we're talking about. So can we hit the video play? Yes. Great. The Eden Academy is a family of schools and we believe that by working together we become stronger as practitioners. The expectations are really that the pupils across the academy can achieve the best that they can achieve by enabling children to overcome some of the many obstacles that they face in terms of their language, their communication, their ability, their physical challenges, their emotional needs. We have to make sure any therapy needs such as OT needs and communication needs are met within the classroom. Our therapy team helps our children understand and come to terms with their emotions and be able to express themselves in ways other than language sometimes. I'm a parent of a little girl at Grangewood and she's been there for three years. I think it's really helped Melissa come out of herself and gaining confidence. We have to make sure that we are using the communication aids that are specific to each child. We use eye gaze machines which enable children who don't have movement within their hands to use their eyes to select and pick different things and communication talkers to communicate to the teacher. Cinnamon, what is your favourite thing at Moorcroft School? Shop. Well done, so you go... Shopping. It's really about empowering students, first of all, to know what's available because it's not just about acceptance within the local community, it's about enabling our students to actually participate so that they can really have much more fulfilling and enriched lives. They're very mindful of the fact that every child needs to have a curriculum that's really specific to them. My son Jack, to get him to concentrate on tasks, it's very important he then has an activity afterwards and that might be jumping on the trampoline or out on the playground, so that really helps him. In trampoline I've done a tug jump and spin around and sit down. My favourite lesson is science because you can learn how to do experiments. Melissa enjoys the outdoor play areas, being with her friends, with a group of children who understand her, who interact with her. We've got a whole range of different things. We've got hydrotherapy pools, we've got sensory rooms. But I think the best facility and best resource we've got is our staff. The staff are great. There's always somebody there to call if you need help. As a family of schools who work in close alliance with the RNIB, we have the opportunity to pool our resources so that we can offer a greater range of opportunities, not only for our pupils, but also for our families and staff members. Jack's older sister went to the sibling group and that was very helpful for them because they got to meet other children that they could talk to about how Jack's disabilities and autism impacts them as a family. Everybody makes an effort in making my daughter Emma happy. Throughout the year the school organises barbecues, parenting sessions regarding all sorts of different issues. For example, the most important thing that you have to be aware of is patience and that's something we learned through parenting courses at Sunshine House. It's really important that we've got a curriculum for our children that is motivating, stimulating, exciting, so that children want to keep coming back for more. And the education for our children needs to be a really meaningful experience and relevant to their lives. Okay. So that just gives you a little bit of a flavour of the young people that we work with. Um, if we can have it back on the slide deck now, that would be great. So I should explain that everything that I'm going to say now is premised on two fundamental beliefs. Uh, firstly, that all children have an entitlement to education. And secondly, all children have the capacity to make progress. And I think those are easy things to say. But I sometimes think that the building blocks that underpin our education systems, our policies, our teaching practices, sometimes societal and community values, our infrastructure, the way we resource things, and certainly our curriculum and assessment systems don't always make that easy. Uh, certainly in the schools that, in which I work, we still battle all the time with uh, a belief from some sections of society and, and, and some educators that what our children need is care. 
They don't need education, they need care. And I think that education is a fundamental human right to which every child is entitled. And therefore, actually, we need to think really carefully about the progression and assessment of what these young people are doing in schools. So just an overview, because I mean, I talked a lot in that last section about progression. We need to understand progression in order to be able to assess that progression. So just an overview then of the curriculum pathways uh, that we have in our uh, schools for children with different abilities. So what you'll see is we've got four different pathways there. Right at the bottom extend which is for children with more moderate learning difficulties so those are the children that are likely to be able to take entry-level examinations etc they're not the children I'm going to be talking about as much today I'm going to be talking about the children on the other three pathways so from the top you've got the pre-formal learning pathway where you, and that's for children really who have profound and multiple learning difficulties who may also have multi-sensory impairment they may also be uh, have some sort of physical disability as well I'm there, the, the second pathway is for semi-formal learners. So those children are likely to have severe learning difficulties but are also likely to be on the autistic spectrum. And then the third semi-formal pathway uh, is for those uh, children who probably also have uh, so severe to moderate learning difficulties but may be able to ac access things like functional literacy and functional maths. Now, on the left-hand side... Let me see if I can point an, an arrow to it. On the, on the left-hand side, you'll see that what, the first thing that we do is we band our children according to their abilities in communication. So what you'll see right at the top with our pre-formal learning pathways, you've got reflex learners. Okay? So those are children of any age between you know, 4 and 19 who are at the very, very earliest stages of, of, of development. So you're talking about children who are um, functioning at, say, 0 to 5 months. Okay, so they are a reflex learner because they're, they're learning to, to respond to you, just like a baby does. You know, they hear mum's voice and they turn their head because they're excited to hear a familiar voice. That's the sort of child that we're talking about in terms of a reflex learner, right at the very beginning of development all the way to a conversational communicator, uh, and you'll see the difference in a minute. So what we do then is we have different uh, expectations of how staff will respond to those children depending on, at the, uh, depending on the level at which they are at. So this is written from the perspective of a learner, what you see in front of you. So with those reflex learners, so those learners that are right at the beginning of development, you're talking about Please respond consistently to all my actions because I need to learn from your consistency. So, uh, so and then really respond attentively to what I do. Create a relationship with me, create an environment where I will use all my senses and create a really predictable environment for me so I know what's going to happen, okay? So those are the very, very uh, learners that find things most challenging all the way up to conversational communicators where actually you're talking about different grammatical structures uh, you're talking about children being taught about how to answer why questions how they can transfer their knowledge etc so those are the kind of range of children we're talking about and like I said the first thing that we do is we make sure we understand where they are in terms of their ability to communicate successfully and what we found with the assessment of progress of pupils with the most complex needs, first of all, we definitely need a much, much more refined assessment scale. So children like the ones that in my schools make infinitesimally small steps of progress. So I need to be really, really clear where I'm trying to take them with each lesson that I deliver. Okay, so we need a really refined assessment scale. We need to constantly triangulate that. So we need a wide range of tools in our tool basket in order to do that. We need to capture both linear and lateral progression. And finally, we need to involve everybody in assessing a young person's progress. And that's, that's, that's really important. Um, and I'll come on to say a little bit more about parents' involvement in, 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 in assessment of these learners in a minute. Oh, okay. I'll go as quickly as I can. It might be 10. <laughs> I'll do, do it quickly. Okay, so I'm going to do two tools, that's all, and then I'm going to whiz through. So... The first tool in our toolbox is called MAP. In England, if you have a certain level of needs, you have something called an education, health and care plan. That is a legal document which entitles you to certain education, health and social care support. Okay? This is a real one that you've got in front of you. You'll see it covers four areas. Communication and interaction, sensory and physical, 
social, emotional and mental health, and cognition and learning. And you will see that the targets within that are big. Okay, so it says under communication and interaction, for example, by the end of key stage two, that's the end of primary school, at the end of primary school, X will be able to follow key classroom instructions, will be able to request something in order to get their needs met and be comfortable interacting with adults and children. That's a big target. Okay, so what we do with MAP is we break that down into much more manageable steps. So you will see on the left hand side of that, the two targets for this particular child for this term are that X will use two word phrases to comment or request what she wants. I want a ball, want chocolate, <laughs> want tea. <laughs> And she will also use a formal communication method to request something that is meaningful to her. So rather than grabbing somebody and pulling something, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use a formal communication method in order that she can demonstrate what she wants. All right? We then assess those against four scales. These are the MAP scales, okay? Independence, fluency, maintenance, and generalization. Each one is a 10-point scale. So independence... Does, is what you can imagine, okay? If you're at number one, you need help with everything. If you're at number 10, you can do something completely independently. Fluency means how fluidly you can do something. So if you think about one of those boxes that you might get with shape holes in and the children have to put the shape into the correct shape hole, how quickly can a child look at a triangle, say, twist it round and then push it through the box? That's how fluently you can do a particular task. Maintenance is... Have you only done it once, or are you doing it numerous times? Can you do it in lots, you know, lo lots of different times? We've seen you do it a lot. And generalization is, can you apply it in a different context? Okay, so that gives us a scale where we can track progress of our children, all right, against those four different things. So you'll end up with a progress chart that looks a little bit like that. So this particular target was to participate in tabletop activities with adult support for three to five minutes. And what you'll see is that with this particular child, when they were benchlined, that's what the B stands for, uh, right at the beginning of the term, they were not able to do anything particularly independently. So they were, they were at uh, stage one, two, and three of the independence, if I remind you what the independence thing was, the learner is provided with support throughout the task. Support may be in the form of physical, gestural, or spoken help. But actually, by the end of term, they've moved a long way forward. They're beginning to be able to participate in a tabletop activity for between three to five minutes in a, in a, in, in a, in a more independent way. So what that's showing you then is that this child has moved forward nine steps across independence, fluency, maintenance. Do you want me to stop? Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, but it involves teachers making a judgment about how well a child has done in relation to those four indications. Okay. I'm, he wants me to stop. So I'm just going to give you one more quick thing, um, which is around... Uh, the branches. So that's one tool, that's the map tool. The second tool is about the branches, which is to do with um, our Cherry Garden assessment system, which we capture on Tapestry. Tapestry is an online platform. You can use other online platforms. We use Tapestry. It may be worth you looking at. Essentially, if we remember the different stages of the learners, we've got reflex learn to, com to conversational communicator, branch one to three, all the way to branches nine and ten. Covers these following areas, communication, language and literacy, physical development, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But against those branches are all de developmental stages of a child's progression. So branch one, zero to five months. Branch nine is 48 to 60 months. Each one of those, then, is broken down into little steps. So if I just look at physical development, I'll just take that as the one example. If you're talking about children at the very, very earliest stages of development, in terms of physical development, turning your head to respond to something is going to be your first branch. All the way up to step 10, I can attempt to jump using a skipping rope. All right, I haven't got time to go into the other ones now. So what's brilliant about Tapestry is that it enables you to capture this via video, via um, uh, sound recordings, via pictures, etc., etc., which really, really helps triangulate all of those uh, different observations that you've made. Importantly, it also allows parents to make observations against those judgments as well. So a teach each child has a login, 
the teacher makes observations about that child. Parents can also log in and uh, make comments about that particular child's development, leading to a summative ass assessment at the end, which says a child is secure in this area, they're developing in other areas, and they might be em emerging in terms of their development in another area. Because quite a lot of our children have spiky profiles. They might be good in one area and not good in another. So, in conclusion, if we just go back then to what I said about the purpose and role of assessment, what this allows us to do, essentially, what allows this to do, essentially, is to have a really clear purpose for why we're assessing something. It means that everybody understands the very, very small steps that a child is making in terms of their development. It means that assessments are clearly aligned with each child's individual curriculum and ensures that we are not assessing irrelevant things. And it allows us to capture progress at multiple different occasions so we can be really really confident that a child has really secured that particular aspect of learning okay i'll i'll finish there thanks very much thank you. a round of applause for her please thank you thank you uh, miss Dartlas. Uh, uh, i do think uh, uh, this presentations there are papers in the program so that if uh, 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 having stopped short of a, a presentation, you can still go further and read it in the publication somewhere. Uh, I think the organizing committee has got copies of the papers. Uh, it's because of time pressure, Medatlas, the fact that uh, we, we have to, uh, we had, I had to stop you. We have a uh, let me manage the, the, the stage now. We have two more presentations. These are uh, 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 plenary sessions. Each presentation is given 45 minutes, but I would want to urge the presenters that uh, uh, please leave some time out of that 45 minutes so that at the end uh, uh, we can interact with the, the audience for questions and other clarifications. So the next uh, 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 presentation is uh, uh, Ms. Anne Ngatia from NEC, who will be presenting on assessing for today and tomorrow, implementation of competency-based assessments in Kenya. She will then be followed by uh, Dr. Sylvia Montoya, director at UNESCO Institute of Statistics, and uh, she will also present on the title that we shall announce when she comes in. So at this moment, let me leave the stage to uh, Ms. Ngatia to come and present. Thank you. We will also be sharing the experiences of what we have managed to do so far, uh, lessons that we have learned as we continue to implement uh, the competency-based curriculum and of course, the challenges that uh, uh, come along with uh, implementation of education reforms. Uh, what I'll be presenting, again, is not my own work. It is work that uh, belongs to the Kenya National Examinations Council, guided by our Chief Executive Officer, Dr. David Jengere. And uh, I want us to... Uh, think about uh, assessment and actually assessing for today and tomorrow. Why assessing for today? It's because uh, we need to find out what skills, what competences our learners have, what skills, what competences our learners have today. And for tomorrow, we need to find out with the potential that they have once we identify that potential, how do we nurture so that they can grow those competencies, so that they can grow th that potential that that learner has? So the question that we'll be asking ourselves throughout this presentation is, do we know our learners? Do we understand who our learners are? Do we understand who our learners are Every time we go to class, uh, every time 
we sit down to put a test or an assessment item down. And we also need to ask ourselves, as assessors, as educators, are we finding our learners' abilities and the learning gaps that they do have? Which methods are we using to be able to identify the ability of the learners? And those gaps that they have come to class with, that they have come to the assessment room with, and how then do we uh, help them to close the gaps that we have? So the critical question that we'll be asking ourselves is, are we inclusive or are we leaving some learners behind because of the method that we are using to assess? When we rely on only one assessment, are we leaving some behind because we have given a written test, but they learn best by hearing or they learn best by performing and by doing? And uh, we also uh, want to ask ourselves that uh, our students are hidden treasure that we are reaching far behind the thorns and they have hidden themselves very well behind timidity, fear, low self-esteem, failure and sadness. So we find that our learners sometimes are not able to express themselves while they are in class. Sometimes they are not able to express themselves when we give them an assessment. But as educators, what are some of the ways that we shall use or we should use so that we can bring them out, so that we can remove the timidity in them, we can remove the fear, we can raise their self-esteem and make them to have a high regard about the potential that they possess. Uh, and we will do this by realizing that uh, our learners learn very differently and therefore as educators, as assessors, then we need to know that there are learners who will learn best when they see their visual. Others are audio or they learn best through the auditory methods. And therefore, even as we give assessments, then we will need to vary so that we take care of each learner. There are learners who may not be able to express themselves orally, but once you give them something to do, something to perform, uh, then you find that they are excelling. So it is then important that we vary the assessment methods and so that we are able to take care of the different learners uh, that we have. How then do we bring the school system into the 21st century? I think we are all speaking about the 21st century skills and we need to relook, we need to reflect about how our school systems are, how our assessment systems are, how our curriculum is, and ask ourselves, are we really in the 21st century? Uh, so we know that we are now in the knowledge economy and how do we as educators contribute to the knowledge economy? The infrastructure that we have, the resources, the kind of education, is it a balanced education? And so that we are sure that uh, at the end of an education program, then we are contributing to the knowledge economy. In this 21st century then, we will need to ensure that the learners that we are handling in our classes, in our assessment rooms, are learners who can frame their own problems and also solve problems. Learners who can independently find and manage information. So we are used to probably to uh, scenarios where the teacher stands and gives all the information. But in the knowledge economy, we need to move to the learner-centered where we give the learner opportunity and space to find and manage information as they solve their problems, as they come up with new products uh, that will solve problems in the society. We also need to make sure that the learners can collaborate so that they can tackle novel issues. Are we giving them opportunities to apply 
knowledge that they have learned in new settings or new contexts. And therefore, as assessment uh, boards or assessment, assessment councils and educators, we will need to focus our curriculum on standards that will enable the learners to invent, uh, create, use knowledge in new ways, and most importantly, that they can learn independently. So it is important that therefore we have to change the assessments, methods, assessment tools uh, that we have been using and so that we are able to assess the higher order thinking skills that will help them to acquire the 21st century skills. We will need to give opportunities to learners in class and in the assessment rooms to be able to solve problems, to be able to investigate, to conduct uh, research and also to reflect. Uh, Kenya has reformed its curriculum and uh, we are now calling that curriculum the competency-based curriculum. I know yesterday there was uh, uh, something talked about what have we been doing all along that we are now saying we are going into the competency but I want to say yes that we were still uh, having a competency-based curriculum but I think now we are emphasizing it more. We are changing the ways in which we are teaching, we are changing the ways in which we are assessing, and so that we can uh, be able to bring out the potential, the competences of our learners. So the curriculum for Kenya now, which we are calling the competency-based curriculum, uh, it seeks to ensure that the future, the future generations of the Kenya citizens are patriotic, but at the same time, they are global. So they'll be taught about the Kenyan culture, they'll be taught about the environment, but at the same time, we will also, or we are making sure that they learn what happens uh, globally, because they are co going to compete with other learners uh, in the world. The other vision or mission of the competency-based curriculum it seeks to equip the learners with knowledge, skills, attitudes, and values, and so that they can thrive in the modern world. Again, we want to produce learners who are confident and who are proud of their rich cultural heritage. So a lot of the content within the curriculum is uh, looking into making sure that the learners can exhibit their potential at all times. And this is being done through nurturing every learner's potential. That we realize that every learner has potential, irrespective of their age, irrespective of whether they have special needs or disabilities, every learner has uh, potential. So as Kenya National Examinations Council then, uh, we have been able to conceptualize the competency-based curriculum and have come up with ways of how best to assess. And I want to say that uh, one of the reasons that the curriculum was being reviewed is because uh, the public felt that there was too much emphasis on examinations. Too much emphasis on examinations which were coming at the end of a program like uh, a cycle, primary school cycle, secondary school cycle. However, when we as the Kenya National Examinations Council did the examinations or assessed the learners, there was no way of feeding back. Once you do uh, the primary school examination, the feedback does not benefit that particular cohort. And therefore, there was need to have continuous assessments in form of school-based assessments and so that we can continuously give feedback. Uh, we can continuously give feedback to our learners. So some of the shifts that uh, NEC has brought on board is that we have moved from reliance from summative assessments to formative assessments. So we are no longer just giving examinations at the end of primary, at the end of secondary. But we have introduced formative assessments to a large extent. 
So we're calling that the school-based assessments that we are giving right from grade four all the way to the end of basic education, which is grade 12. And these school-based assessments really are meant to improve instruction. They are meant to assess for learning. And so that that feedback is a continuous way of telling the learner what potential do they have, what competencies do they have, what gaps do they have, and how do they close those gaps. The school-based assessments are also focusing on assessment as learning. So you'll find that the assessments that we are giving to the learners are assessments that will give room for self-reflection, will give room for peer reflection or peer assessment uh, in terms of group work, working in pairs, and so that continually the learners can get feedback from the their peers. Uh, we are also embracing the assessment as learning at the critical stages or at the key stages. So the competency-based curriculum has been divided into three tiers. Then the first tier is the early years education, which is from the pre-primary all the way to grade one, two, and three. So that's the first tier. The second tier is what we are calling the middle school. Uh, which is grade four, five, six, uh, seven, eight, and nine. But we break down the middle school into two uh, areas, that is the upper primary and the junior school. So, we've, and then we go to senior school as the third tier. So the key stages are the end of early years, at the end of grade three, at the end of primary, at the end of junior school, and at the end of uh, senior school. So at those critical stages then, we want as a country to know how the education system is doing and therefore and therefore we are assessing uh, using summative assessments at those particular uh, stages. Uh, we have also embraced authentic assessments assessments that mimic real life situations. So it is no longer the road kind of learning, the road kind of assessment, but we are coming up with tasks that help learners uh, apply knowledge in real life situations. Uh, integrated assessment is also another shift whereby uh, we are saying that subjects do not operate in silos but knowledge is spread across subjects and we are able to come up with thematic areas to assess uh, thematic areas which can draw knowledge from different uh, subjects. Then we are also assessing the core competences like Susan has said, we have been working with British Council to unpack the skills builder and we have been able to map out or to contextualize the skills builder to the Kenyan context. And we are able to map the steps that Susan has talked about to our Kenyan curriculum. So for each step, we are able to map that uh, to different grades, and we are able to assess the core competencies. The core competencies uh, for Kenya are communication and collaboration. We have digital literacy, learning to learn, uh, self-efficacy, uh, critical thinking and problem solving, uh, et cetera, et cetera. We have quite a number, around seven, that Kenya is actually targeting, uh, targeting. So why are we embracing authentic assessments? We are embracing authentic assessments uh, because we want to focus more on the process than the product. We want to monitor, we want to track the progress of the learner as learning is taking place, as opposed to waiting for the learner to finish the program and assess. So we really are interested in tracking how the learner is performing during the instruction. And tools on a competency-based assessment portal for our schools to download and administer. So we want to give more roles to the teacher and so that the teacher can administer 
and as they are administering, they are also monitoring and giving feedback to the schools or to the learners immediately. Unlike waiting for where NEC has to bring back all the papers and uh, mark them at a central place and release the results. One interesting thing about school-based assessment is that we have also allowed flexible periods. So they are conducted over flexible period. It is not timed like 9 to 10. And so that we give enough time, enough opportunities for the learners to exhibit the potentials that they have. The school-based assessments also are employing a number of assessment methods and tools. So there's a lot of projects that we are giving in the science, home science, agriculture, and all other subjects. We are also uh, giving uh, portfolio assessment so that uh, the learners can be able to uh, keep record, maintain record of what they have been able to do and the parent also can be involved. I talked about integrated assessment. Uh, why integrated assessment? Integrated assessment is where we are saying that we need to adopt an interdisciplinary approach where we are able to come up with one thematic area and we are able to infuse the knowledge that is learned in other subjects uh, to be able to tackle that particular uh, problem. Again, this is done for our grade three learners and it's a project that we give for two months. And I want to say that the learners are enjoying this very much because these are open-ended questions. Uh, they are project tasks that allow the learners to contextualize within the environment, to improvise, to use locally available materials, and they are able to exhibit using different uh, methods. Uh, then in terms of inclusivity, so that we are not leaving any learner behind, then as a, an examinations council, uh, we have made sure that we have a curriculum, we have assessments that take care of all learners, learners with mild disabilities and also learners with severe disabilities. And therefore, we take care of all learners who are visually impaired, hearing impaired, uh, physically handicapped uh, through adapting their assessments and also giving separate assessments for those learners with severe disabilities who are following what we are calling uh, the special needs pathway or the stage-based pathway. Again, we ensure that uh, we are flexible in terms of the time and only assess those learners when they are ready. Uh, this is just uh, examples of thematic areas of the, uh, of the integrated assessment. For example, we give a thematic area developing and nurturing moral values in learners for an ethical society. And that is derived from the general learning outcomes of the early years. And what happens is that we are then able to come up with specific tasks that will address those particular themes. And we use assessment rubrics, we use observation checklists, uh, so that we are able to track the progress of the learner as uh, they move on. Uh, allow me just to wind up. In terms of reporting, uh, we have also shifted from relying on quantitative scores and we now are embracing both qualitative and quantitative data. Because we realize that uh, just giving a score does not really tell about the nature of the learning gap that the learner has. But the qualitative data will be able to delve deeper and describe the learning gap that the learner has. So we are using assessment rubrics uh, whereby we have uh, you, we are using the four performance levels uh, of exceeding expectation, meeting expectation, approaching, and below uh, expectation. We have de-emphasized uh, grading and ranking for the school-based assessments, and so that uh, within the cohort, within the grade, then the learners are more interested with what competencies do they have? Have they met the expectations of that particular assessment uh, that is given. 
we have also integrated ICT in our assessments uh, through registration or giving a unique number right from grade three and so that we can track this learner all the way when, until when they finish basic education. We keep records using the school year reports uh, so that even by the time the learners are choosing their pathways as they go into senior school, then we can fall back to that uh, performance using the uh, unique assessment number and be able to give guidance on the best career pathway for them to choose. We are also using ICT to disseminate our reports uh, as and when they are ready. A run through, of course, we have had a number of challenges, uh, but I will not go through all of them. But uh, the CBC or the competency based curriculum is focusing a lot on parental engagement, but we find that our parents are not very willing, or some of them are not willing to really help their learners with uh, some of the work that is given to them or when they are carrying out the project, and therefore they feel like there is too much burden. Uh, the public also uh, does query whether when we leave all the assessments to the teachers, it is quite objective, but we want to say that uh, so far, so good, that the teachers have been quite objective in the primary school uh, in terms of the scores that we have been uh, receiving. As I conclude, I want to say that uh, from the experiences that we have had in implementation of the competency-based curricula, uh, we have seen a lot of benefits by having the frequent uh, assessments being done when learning is taking place. We have seen learners enjoying doing practical, doing performance assessments, going to the garden and coming up, uh, growing their own crop, harvesting it, uh, cooking their own food in home science, in science and technology, we have seen them uh, carry out tasks that are bringing in a lot of innovation and creativity, and we can say that learning is becoming enjoyable. And we have also seen that because of the assessments that we have been giving, they are actually driving instruction. So the kind of assessments that we have given have actually reformed how teachers are teaching. And therefore, as assessors, as educators, then we must always thrive to establish and report the true ability of the learners and help the learners close the learning gaps that they do have by using a variety of assessment methods uh, and not just one particular method. And as I finish, I want to say that uh, we also learn that learning is not the product of teaching. But actually, we can say that learning is taking place when we actually see the activities that the learners are undertaking and we see the products that they are coming up with. Thank you very much. Thank, thanks a lot, Ms. Ngatia. At least you was able to push it through to the conclusion. And I, I, I'm not feeling guilty that I, <laughs> I, I had to cut uh, short. We are going to go on to the third presenter, Dr. Sylvia Montoya from UNESCO. It seems there are two presenters there, but the, the, the other presenter will just support uh, 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 Dr. Montoya at the end when we start que asking questions. Uh, she will support her at that stage. And uh, we have uh, 30 minutes, Dr. Montoya. Please leave out some time for questions and answers. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> Thank you so much. In the, in the land of Elius Kichogi, I think I will have to run the marathon. So, but let's see, I run marathon, so it's a good experience. So, I am the director of the UNESCO Institute for Statistics. We're the Global Custodian Agency for SDG4, and we're also co-chairing with the CESA, uh, the CESA framework of the African Union regarding the data and monitoring. So, I am speaking on the reporting on behalf of the two frameworks that are relevant for this discussion, that are the global and the regional framework, the CESA framework. So I would like to share with you some experience that some of the countries who are here in the room are already experiencing. Uh, Kenya is one of our partners, Zambia is another of the ones. We have the Gambia also working with us, we have Lesotho, and in the past we have a few other countries that you will see. So a little bit of context to start. 
We have a SDG 4 1.1, that is the indicator that is actually agreed at the global level to report, but it's also an indicator in the CESA framework that, as you all know better than me, precedes the global agenda. So we have these two indicators that are uh, equivalent. Uh, the CESA indicator measures also science, but basically, uh,
cross-national tools that are available, the international studies such as peers and teams in primary, and we have cross-national studies also that are all the regional assessment, the PILNA in the Pacific, in the Southeast Asia, the CPLM, in Africa, PASEC and SAGMEC, and the laboratory of UNESCO in Latin America, and we are using high quality national assessment, so we're using the national assessment to report using either non-psychometric methods such as the pairwise and the policy linking and the AMPO that is a set of module, the module of, uh, uh, that is actually calibrated to the, uh, to the minimum proficiency level. Why we're really trying to identify into the national assessment? Because as I have explained, we have built bottom up the definition of the minimum proficiency level that is based on what the countries are doing and the international and regional programs are, the, are having definition of proficiency levels that have been agreed in the group of countries who are participating. So what we, have to, we are doing right now is using approximations of the proficiency level that the assessment program have for the sake of reporting but they are in some of the cases that proxies or approximation to the minimum proficiency level. But basically what we are trying to propose and we are really making a huge effort to do is to try to see how we can use the national tools to report to the international level and both at the global and the regional. But let me stop in the AMPO, in the assessment of minimum proficiency level. It's not a full-fledged assessment. It's just a tool that is having 20 items that are calibrated to measuring the definition of the minimum proficiency minister as a standalone, but it's a very short assessment, or could be integrated into the national assessment, and we have uh, various experience of this type, the, the assessment that are implemented by the PAL network, and then we have some foundational learning assessments, such as EGRA, EGMA, and the, the foundational learning module that is part of the UNICEF program mix. So, what we are actually trying to do from the global level, and this is one of the areas that we really try to, to see, how we can, you can make a most uh, use of the tools that are available as global public goods. So in each of the levels, actually you can add these models to your national assessment. So for instance, for indicator in early grade for 11A, you can add the AMPO-A, that is the module that is calibrated exactly uh, to that proficiency level. The module is not enough to measure all the skills or the range of skills in early grades, but it's calibrated for the minimum proficiency level, so you can add to the national assessment. Then you can do the same at the end of primary with, forward, with the AMPO-B, and then at the end of lower secondary, there is also a module under development uh, for the U by the UIS with some technical partners, but also OECD, PISA, has developed a module that is not the whole test, but just only one module that could be added also to the national assessment for the sake of reporting for the global and the regional indicator. How you can combine this tool that is just a module for the minimum proficiency level with some other tools that are available, you can add some of the tools to measure skills that are to the left or that are lower than the minimum proficiency level, that in some of the cases is still uh, not managed for every child in the classroom, so you can actually have uh, uh, some other tools that are adding to try to actually to measure levels that are lower than the minimum proficiency level. So for instance, uh, for early grades, you can add to the AMPO-A and to your national assessment as well, some of the tools that are measuring more a, a more earlier skills to the, to the learning to, to read, and then you can use some of the accuracy and fluency and oral fluency using tools such as EGRA and EGMA. You can also use, at the end of primary, the AMPO-A, so this is an experience that we're running with some of the countries, that you can measure uh, the, the proficiency level at the end of primary. You, you can also try to understand, at the end of primary, how many students are only mastering the level of early grades at the end of primary, which is an information that this is useful uh, for policy making. So you can actually add these tools uh, to the national initiatives in order to be able to report and to understand better. And this is one of the tools that we are administering in this moment. What is the, the advantage you have in, in actually implementing, and we have a very nice experience with Kenya before and, and now with the AMPOA, is the technical rigor and, efficient, and uh, efficiency in the implementation. The module is based on, on technical standards that are published and known is uh, modern measurement practices and you have a scientific sampling, which is, not, uh, is very important in order to report at the national and the regional level. 
Then you have efficiency in the data collection because we have instruments that you can take advantage and make use of them. It's implemented once, so you can choose when to implement and, and then to repeat uh, as you want as a country level. Then you have the reporting with sub-regional level, for instance, at the province or a state level in a country. Uh, we also pay a lot of attention to the issue of capacity development. The, the objective of UNESCO is to transfer the technology to the countries. So we place very important uh, role to capacity development. That is the informal one by participating in the meetings, by learning, by having a line, a 0 800 uh, learning that you can call to the experts in the different areas uh, to check uh, of field operation, of quality assurance, or what are the different step of the assessment. But also we have modules of uh, formal capacity development. Uh, we have a, an online, so far it has been implemented, modules where we ask also countries to share their national uh, items and their concerns so we can actually adjust and, and make uh, 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 available uh, our expertise and the expertise of our technical partners regarding areas that are relevant to the countries, and these are the four ones that we have already uh, implemented, the objective measurement, item response theory, uh, using a statistic to develop assessment and analysis of data from comp uh, complex sample. So this is how uh, AMPO, the module, has uh, been implemented so far. In some cases, it has been a standalone, so the country didn't have any assessment and needed to assess or was not having uh, immediately the decision to take an assessment, and this is actually running a day. Uh, we are actually implemented in the Gambia currently at the early grade 411A, and, and in general, as you see, we have the tool in French and in English. Uh, in 2021, we have also implemented with PASEC in four of the PASEC countries. Uh, we have inserted AMPO in the regional assessment and repeated to measure the, uh, the learning losses due to COVID. And we have two countries that we have implemented AMPO with the national assessment, that are Zambia and Kenya. And uh, uh, we have also uh, uh, translated the tool to Arabic and to Urdu, and uh, now currently in Hindi, in India, the only country that is outside the region is India, uh, in case of the massive implementation that now uh, India is piloting to implement next year in English and in Hindi, uh, the tool in early grades. So you can actually use the uh, advantage of AMPO by integrating AMPO in the national assessment. You can do also use AMPO as a module uh, along the highest tech examination uh, on a sample base. For instance, you can run an examination that is an individual reporting, but then you can take a sample of students and in an anonymous basis, you can take advantage of that logistic and actually run the assessment and, uh, and uh, being able to report at the global level without having to duplicate uh, uh, logistics and organization. And you can also combine uh, this module with some other tools that are understanding and helping to understand if the curriculum and the assessment are aligned uh, to the global level, such as the uh, policy linking and the pairwise comparison. So I will um, actually go directly to this uh, last slide that we see that the one possibility is to try to have the national examination, which is universal, is curriculum based and aims to have an individual certification. And then you have the national learning assessment that is sample based in general, could be universal, but in general is sample, that, that try to look at the curriculum and the competency in a, trying to understand how the system is doing, to evaluate the system progress. And to both, you can add the AMPO and try to see how you can get a holistic view of the system by actually using this type of tools and actually is helping uh, to try to make a whole uh, use of all the resources at the country level. So with that, and hoping that they have respected the time, I am going to close here, and thank you so much. Thanks once again, Dr. Montoya, uh, for the elaborate presentation made in good time. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have uh, had the three presenters, uh, starting with uh, Susan Datlas, uh, Anne Gatia, and lastly, uh, uh, Sylvia Montoya. I suppose you have uh, questions. So we'll open the floor for questions 
for uh, seeking clarification if you need any clarification or for filling in if you think uh, uh, you might have sensed a gap somewhere that you think you want to fill in. There must be a roving mic. I'll be calling people from all ends of the building. And when you pick a mic, please tell us uh, what the question, who the question is directed to of the three presenters. Uh, we'll start with you, sir. Uh, say your name, where you come from, and uh, who, who the question is directed to. Over to you, sir. Good. Yeah, thank you. Chair, yeah, my name is Daniel Alenyo from Uganda. From um, my question is directed to Susan uh, regarding the, her presentation. First of all, I'd like to thank you so much for the presentation on capturing progress when things are hard to measure. And this is particularly for learners with special needs. Uh, my question, Susan, is that uh, how do you aggregate the data generated through the use of the various checklists? I, you gave some examples, particularly for reporting assessment progress, especially when you are determining levels of proficiency. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll pick three questions and then allow them to answer. There was a hand that, at the side. Uh, Madam, in front. And then I'll go this side after that. Yes. Thank you. Uh, my name is Eba from Zimbabwe. My question is directed to Anne. I have got a uh, two points that I need clarification from N. The first one is already we are having some technological challenges. What are you doing to make sure that these assessments that are delivered digitally do not relegate some schools which are remote? The second one is um, can you please clarify how you manage uh, the massive data that comes from taking primary school learners uh, maybe from the infant classes right up to the end of primary um, classes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the teleporter, will, I'll come to you, Rara Kumis. The teleporter. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. My, my name is Biki Leporta from South Africa. My question is directed to Dr. Montoya. Thank you for the presentation. Um, yes, I do agree that we need to compare using the same reference. But the question is here because I see that you're dealing in different jurisdictions where you have to use different languages to assess the same skills. How do you deal with issues of um, mistranslations in the work that you do? Because on the basis of research that has been done in some parts of the world, instruments such as the pills are not without challenges. And that creates problems if one has to compare achievements across jurisdictions because of the challenges created by translations. Lack of equivalence. Thank you. Thank you. I'll take another round of three questions. Let me get to the gentleman uh, behind you. Flung, raised your hand. Okay. Thank you. Um, my name is Dr. Ario Akinyeli from Nigeria. Uh, my question is directed to Dr. Montaya, the second presenter. She mentioned uh, the various types of assessments inclusivity in assessment, but she mentioned about integrated assessments. I'm very, very uh, interested in that, but how do you do integrated assessment and you will not be violating the rule of uh, the theory behind the assessment that as, uh, items should be unidimensional, uh, local independence. How do you take uh, care of that, that you are not violating that rule? In your assessment, since you are using integrated assessment. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Dr. Akometi. Uh, 
Thank you, Chairperson. My name is Mafura Kometi. I come from uh, Umalusi in South Africa. Uh, let, me, let me appreciate all the presentations. Um, I truly enjoy them. My question is directed uh, to Mengashia from NEC, a former colleague of mine. She has visited Umalusi as well, where she says uh, they have standardized SBA prepared for the, for the schools and uploaded for them. I want to know what does this do to the capacity of teachers to assess in the long term? Because in my own view, you are spoon feeding them and you are taking their capacity to, to, to assess. And uh, my own view is that in the long term, you may have unintended consequences of having teachers at school level who cannot assess because NEC is spoon feeding them with standardized tests that they have to administer on their students. That is my question. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Okometsi. I'll come to you. Let me take one last question and then they will respond. Uh, we'll take another round of questioning. Let me get to Madam here. Uh, th thank you very much for uh, the very inspiring presentations. Uh, my question goes to the officer from uh, Kenya National Examination Council. I'm really very happy and excited to hear that you have three tiers, and the three tiers are capturing the areas. I took note of the core competences that you highlighted, and my concern goes to a question. Do you still deal with subjects or learning areas? How are you dealing, how are you handling so that you, you meet the core competences? Two, how are you grading? How are you grading uh, or awarding the competences? You talked about parents' involvement. What are your plans to lift and have it at high? I submit. Thank you. Let me give this time to the presenters to respond to the questions. Uh, we are noting the questions. I'll start with uh, Suzanne and respond to all the questions that were asked to you. And then Anne will come and then Montoya Lee. Sure. Okay, thank you for your question, sir. Yours was to do with um, how we aggregate data. What I would say um, is that our children are on a very individualized pathways, and therefore the aggregation of data your right to pick up is problematic. Um, what it, because children are set targets at the beginning of term, what we can do is we can look at, this, at whether children meet targets, which gives us some information about how well that teacher is performing. And I didn't get a chance to talk about Cherry Gardens very much, but that particular system of assessment is used by quite a lot of special schools. So it also allows us to benchmark progress. So we can take a particular group of children that say started on branch one, and we can say, in our case, of the X number of children that started on branch one, you know, they made this number of steps of progress. And we can benchmark that against other schools in relation to those children in those other schools who are also on branch one. But in terms of the aggregation of data for these children, we're not that far ahead, I don't think. And I think that's because we haven't, as yet, agreed a set of standards, either nationally or internationally, about what good progress looks like in relation to these children. So we can look at individual teacher performance, we can benchmark with schools doing similar things, but at the moment, data aggregation, I think, is, a, is we've got a way to go on it. Thanks. Uh, thank you for your questions. Uh, the first one is about uh, the technological challenges. Uh, and I want to say that um, the reason behind why we decided to go uh, uploading the assessment tools on our competency-based assessment portal is so that we can reduce the stakes uh, instead of uh, printing the examination, uh, the assessments and distributing the way we do for national examinations. So that was the, the, the rationale that we had. Uh, we are aware that yes, not all schools may have very reliable internet 
And that is why when we give the assessment, uh, uh, the school-based assessments, then we have the options that uh, they still can access and print. Uh, they can ac access and print and conduct it in the normal way in which they conduct their continuous assessments within their schools. And we also have the other option where those schools that are able to, uh, they have enough gadgets or devices, then they can actually respond online. Uh, in terms of managing the massive data, I think uh, uh, we are able to manage that. As a council, we have enough capacity in terms of the servers, in terms of our database management, and uh, we manage this by ensuring that uh, every learner has been enrolled at grade three, and uh, we have mechanisms within our ICT uh, department where we are able to maintain that data, including even the evidence. If we need like possibly evidence of projects that they have done, uh, we have a few years until we are possibly able to, uh, to be sure that our, our teachers can actually uh, develop uh, quality or reliable items, then we continue to give the standardized uh, assessments. However, the plan in the future is that we could come up with an item uh, writing portal, an item bank, uh, whereby the teachers themselves will actually be posting the questions into our item writing portal and we are able to moderate that and we are able to release the same back to them. But they still have a window of classroom assessments. Classroom assessments uh, within our, our framework is assessments that they do on a day-to-day -day basis. So at that particular point, then we leave it for the teachers to set their own items, administer, and give feedback. The school-based assessments are only done once in a year. But we hope that as we build capacity, we continue to train teachers on an annual basis on competency-based assessments, uh, the shift, how they're going to uh, design the authentic task, how they're going to uh, design the project, and after some time, then we can leave it out for the teachers to manage by themselves. Uh, uh, in terms of the subjects and learning areas, uh, I want to say that we are using both. For the early years, we are calling them learning areas because they are quite expansive. When we talk of environmental activities, uh, that is including the science, agriculture, uh, social studies. But as we progress to higher grades, then they become subjects. Like in grade four, the environmental activities will be broken down into science and technology. It will be broken down into agriculture and social studies. So at the lower years, then we are calling that learning areas because it's for exploratory. It's for them to find their space. It's for them to really understand the basics and the foundational uh, skills. Then uh, how are we grading the core competencies? Uh, I, I think in my presentation I did say that we are really moving away from the grading in terms of percentages, in terms of marks, in terms of grades A, B, and C. And what we really are interested in is what is the evidence that this learner can communicate? And uh, what we are doing is that we are using our checklists, we are using our assessment rubrics, and we are able to tell from the task that we have given how are we able to tell that this learner is communicating appropriately for that particular grade? And we divide the task into the four levels, and we are able to get descriptors for each of the task, for each of the core competence, and we are able to place the learner in one particular level and be able to give a remark on how they have actually uh, performed the particular task that was targeting uh, the core competencies. So we are not grading them as such. And remember that uh, the core competencies will not be assessed in isolation. They are actually infused within the, the content of a particular subject. So as you assess that particular subject, then you will have some tasks that will target uh, core competencies and uh, you'll be able to report that qualitatively. Uh, through observations and through assessment uh, rubrics. 
An interesting one on parental involvement, a parent's day. Uh, we are also asking that as they come up with innovations, then the parents could help in improvisation, in provision of particular materials. So that's how we are involving the parents. We consciously target or develop assessment tasks 